Iowa not only gets them drafted, they get them drafted rather high. We will look back at the NFL draft over the weekend and then also some undrafted free agents from the Hawkeyes 22 edition that may factor in the NFL and make names for themselves. And uh, of course, on the other end of the spectrum is who are options to join the Hawkeyes for the 23 season. We will delve on to both ends of the spectrum here for the next uh, 45 minutes or so right here at the Voice of College Football, Iowa Live with all of you. And of course, the guy that makes it all work, Corey Bratta from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Hey, Corey. How you doing, Mark? I'm doing well. How are you? Doing good. It's a sunny day here in uh, central Iowa. Wind is, it's been maybe the windiest spring that I can remember. It's just every day, just feel like you're walking into a hurricane you walk outside so besides that it's uh it's beautiful it's i think in the 60s today and uh i think finally we're going to uh been planning out a fishing trip i think finally it feels like we're entering into a warmer part of the year so that uh that excites me you like to fish oh i love to fish who doesn't like to Do you? you like to fish no oh <laughs> like i i shouldn't say i don't like to fish i i don't fish uh, I haven't been around, had friends who like to fish, so okay. maybe maybe that would have caused me to, to to fish. I've been fishing a few times, but very few in my life, but uh, it looks fun. Yeah, it I, I okay. love it. It's it's relaxing. I mean, the state, I'm not an ice fisherman, so, you know, it's kind of like golf. Like, it's kind of a half a year type thing, and then you got to wait four to six months to, to do it again. So uh, I'm looking forward to that, and uh, – it's the one thing about football. It gets me through the cold season. Football and basketball get you through the cold season in Iowa. Um, and then you can at least enjoy the outdoors when when there's no sports to talk about, except on Tuesdays at 4.30. Yeah, Tuesdays at 4.30 Central, of course. And um, <clears throat> yeah, we certainly had a near summer spell uh, here for about two weeks in Ohio. And it's turned rather nasty here for quite a long time. But uh, we've got high 70s on the horizon here in the next day or two. Yeah. So I mentioned off the top, uh, I was, um, uh, four players taken, you know, they, they weren't necessarily, you know, at the end of the draft here, you know, they were prominently, um, uh, evaluated by the NFL. I guess we can start with, uh, Lucas Van S, uh, in regards to, uh, let's see, he went, uh, I am blanking out on everything I watched over the weekend concerning the NFL draft to the Packers pick number 13 from a player who technically was not a starter at Iowa, technically speaking. Correct. That's correct. I don't know. I'll, honestly, all four of those draft picks went higher than I think most people expected. Every one of them. Now I know Van Ness had worked his way up into that range because he got taken what 13 overall. Yeah, I don't know. Were there were there people in the, that had him in the top ten? I don't I mean, believe so. That's just insane. I, I guess you know what I would say about the draft is as as you were watching those four players taken, and we can talk about the the lack of production after Riley Moss. Nobody taken in the fourth, fifth, sixth, or seventh round uh, rounds of the draft from Iowa. But you look at those top four; it's almost like they were. Le- you'd think there were less players out there this year because everyone got a bump up it felt like and that I said this on a podcast released yesterday Mark it makes me think that maybe a couple of these guys are better than we thought I mean we all knew Jack Campbell was sensational but not a lot of people had him going in the first round I didn't quite understand that I I don't I'm not a mock draft expert at all but I think I've been telling you for months Mark I don't know how this guy is not a high high end draft pick and when I was hearing at some point uh, in the last couple of months that he made drop to the second or third round, I'm thinking, why? He tested well at the combine. He's huge. I don't know if, you know, there's concerns about his ability in pass coverage. The dude, you knew he, like, if there's anybody, obviously people respect Kirk Ferentz in the NFL. And I think they respect his uh, testament to players, to his players. And if he gives an endorsement to a player, uh, I think a, a – a franchise, a coach, a GM, they're going to listen. And if there's anybody he's going to give a flying, raving endorsement for, it's Jack Campbell. I mean, he's had, obviously, a number of guys over the course of his tenure at Iowa that he thinks very highly, from Bob Sanders to Dallas Clark to now Jack Campbell. Jack Campbell would be – I I mean, I I wasn't really 
following Iowa football in the you know late 1990s, early 2000s, as I was struggling through kindergarten. But I don't can't imagine uh, Kirk Ferentz having more respect for somebody than he has for for Jack Campbell. He, he loves that kid, and that in and of itself was going to help Jack Campbell draft stock wise. And he performed well at the combine. The physical tools are special. His production at Iowa was special. I just never understood how he wasn't a first round draft pick. So it was satisfying to see him get drafted where I thought he deserved to get drafted. And frankly, I'd say the same thing about Sam Laporta, Mark. I've hesitated because you're the voice of college football. I've hesitated on this show to say, oh, he's the best tight end in the country. However, with his production and with his ability to make plays after the catch, sort of similar to a George Kittle. I'm not saying he's going to be the next George Kittle, but I'm just saying his ability to make plays after the catch and stay on his feet is special. Um, I, I was just thrilled to death to see him taken almost first round. What was the second, third pick of, of the of the second yes. round? I mean, incredible. Uh, you almost had three guys in the first round of the NFL draft. That is insane. Um, and they were right there at the top for most. Uh, well, I shouldn't say right there at the top. Very close to the top uh, across the board. I'm sure you have the numbers for most picks in the top three rounds. I don't know what where they would be as far as I think Moss was taken. Am I correct in saying he was taken 83rd overall? Is that the number that you have? I've uh, got Moss at uh, 83rd. Yeah, 83. So I, I'd be curious, in the top 83, how many teams had more players drafted? I would guess you could count the, those schools on one hand. I'd almost guarantee you can count those schools on one hand. And yeah, so, I, can, I can think of three of them. Yeah, Alabama, the Ohio, Alabama, Ohio State, uh, Georgia. Yeah, they, they're sure. the same three that kind of yeah. pop up every year. But I was right there with with the Michigans. With I mean, it is incredible. Now, I was talking to a friend yesterday about this, and I think it's a fair point to make. The fact that Iowa had nobody taken in the latter rounds could be an indication. It's not, it's not just black and white, Mark, but it could be an indication of a lack of depth and development at some key positions elsewhere. And I think that's fair. Like, offensive line is a microcosm of this because you look at offensive line, they've had great individuals. We've talked about Tristan Wirfs and Tyler Linderbaum. What incredible stories those guys are. Although Tristan Wirfs came into the, into college pretty much ready. Tyler Linderbaum was a project. He switches over from, from the defensive line, but Iowa identified him, helped him develop into, you know, a future all pro. And yet there have been a number of guys at other positions along that offensive line that have been, I hate to say it, but flops. They haven't worked out. They've they've left. They've transferred. You know, sometimes it's injuries, which is I'm not saying it's anybody's fault. It's just chance. It is what it is. But I think maybe you're seeing that with Iowa being a developmental school, um, they are really good when they find a diamond in the rough at developing them. But I think this draft, if you want to draw big conclusions from the results from this draft, is it's hard to find enough diamonds in the rough to be elite. And Iowa does it more than almost anybody else. But, you know, the fact that you had nobody else drafted after Riley Moss in the third round is an indicator to me that perhaps there's not the depth. Now, you know, I ripped on Colin Cowherd because he used anecdotal evidence one draft in 2016 to prove that Iowa was the fake idea of college football. And it was a loaded roster that ended up getting a lot of guys drafted the following year. So there will be guys next year. Cooper DeGene is a, is projected early mark to be a first or second round draft pick um you know there there are other guys in this roster Cade McNamara has got a chance obviously to be a draft pick next year Eric all Luke Lachey etc all any of those guys any and all all of those guys could have a chance at being drafted so it is fascinating it's incredible it's I I understand different perspectives is how you want to uh digest the fact that Iowa just continues to do this and rank towards the top of college football with NFL production and high-end NFL production and in spite of the fact that they don't win championships and, and and they're really not close to winning championships more often than not, Mark. Like, with the exception being 2015, they haven't been close. I don't want to hear that they were, they were close in 2021. 20, they were not. <laughs> okay? You, you're not close when you get blown out by 40 in the Big Ten Championship game. That's not close. I don't care if you won your division or not. So, I, I know, you know, Everybody wants to look at it differently. It's either half glass half full, glass half empty. I see it both ways. It's incredible what Kirk and the staff have done, but I can see the the 
the frustrated side of the fan base that says, good Lord, we're developing all these guys and we can't win a Big Ten championship. We haven't won a Big Ten championship since, what, 04? And haven't won an outright Big Ten championship under Kirk Ferentz this century. So, uh, yeah, it's it's a fascinating conversation to have. It's difficult to draw conclusions from one NFL draft, but the points that you make have been repeated over and over and over. So it is impressive to see Iowa have this many selections early in the draft. And again, like you off the top of my head, I believe that those would be the three schools. And those are the three schools almost every year because they've got the most players in the NFL that ranked ahead of Iowa in the early rounds, Michigan fans, before you jump on me, I understand that Michigan had more NFL draft selections than anyone in the big 10, including Ohio state nine to six, but through three rounds, Ohio state had three players in the first round. Um, that, uh, and, and the Big Ten, to widen the topic, uh, had a exceptional draft. Now, the SEC had more players selected when all was said and done through seven rounds at 62-55, but that's a much smaller of a gap or margin between numbers one and two than is typical, number one. Secondly, uh, in counting the first three rounds, the Big Ten at the high end, those first three rounds had four more selections than the SEC, 21-17 in the first three rounds. So good draft from the Big Ten, good draft from Iowa. And I, I do think uh, in addition to our constant theme of looking at the offense versus the defense and the special teams and that dichotomy that is unmatched in college football. This is another one right here that is difficult to find a like program in terms of this NFL production that I believe ranks sixth or seventh currently among NFL rosters. Uh, and, and it's, it's a good program on the field in regards to the results and the win loss, but it's not, anywhere close to what the NFL production would indicate it to be. Yeah, it's no work. Exactly. You're that's the dichotomy. It's nowhere close. Like they're they're probably a top they're a top, I think we can probably agree they're a top 30 to 35 program. Right? Oh we've, sure. We've said that before. Uh, they're probably a top 25 program, but yeah. they are not a top 10 program. And I don't think you could there's no way you could even remotely make that claim. So that's I think the dichotomy. But there is something to be said for the fact that the blue bloods out there, they not only produce NFL talent, but they are loaded with depth because of their ability to recruit. And that's why I have the philosophy, the theory that I do that. I just think it's hard to identify when you're talking, especially when you're talking about a football roster and you need so many guys to make it work. Right, Mark. I mean, if, if you're, I think it's maybe one could argue that a developmental coach at, at, in basketball, it's a little bit easier to win that way. Maybe possibly, because of the fact that you just need less findings or less uh, diamonds in the rough in football. If you're going to be elite, you better have guys everywhere. And if you can't recruit them, you better develop them. And I think Iowa does obviously, again, th they do an excellent job of uh, developing the guys who have the talent to make it work. But if they don't have the talent to make it work, you know, Iowa, you, you can't transform like Mark, if, if they recruited me right now, would I be selected next year like you can't just say well they, why aren't they developing these guys some guys just don't have it so sometimes it's a it's a miss from the an evaluation standpoint and that goes back to recruiting which obviously Iowa that's we're closer right I mean they're they're not top 30 they they are not over the history of Kirk Ferentz's tenure here I would venture to say without looking at the numbers they're probably not top 25 to 30 in recruiting overall for an average maybe they have been in recent years but overall they're probably closer to 40 to 50 so there's the there's the gap and and we kind of find our place right in the middle um the lack of recruiting the exceptional development you end up being a top 25 to 30 program by the way just want to throw this in real quick i don't know if you saw this tweet on thursday night during the draft mark but i did think it was interesting as conversations you and i have had about espn and realignment and the sec and all this stuff did you see the, the the tweet I sent out? Uh, I think it was. Uh, I don't believe see. so. Was it Mike Greenberg? Was he hosting? Was yes. That who it was? He. I think it was him that made the comment. Five of the first six picks have come from either the SEC or Ohio State. I did now, see that. 
in in it, that's a correct statement. It's accurate. But do you see what's stupid about that statement? All six picks came from either the Big Ten or the SEC. You see, and I, I'm not saying Mike Greenberg said that the way he did <clears throat> intentionally to sell the SEC as a as an employee of ESPN, but that's the first thing that ran through my mind, Mark. Why would you why would you clump the SEC together and segregate Ohio State, or I should say isolate Ohio State? Yeah, you know, Ohio State's elite, but you know, we have an entire conference that's pretty no, Illinois had the sixth player in uh, the top six of the draft. I just thought it was a stupid comment. Bama uh, had two, I'm going to defend him to a certain extent. Well, no, you won't, Mark. Bama had two. <laughs> yes, I will defend Bama him to a certain listen, extent. Mar- B- Bama had two picks in, in the top six. Ohio State had two. Florida had one. Illinois had one. Apples to apples. There's no. I could also say, Mark, Mark, I could also say that five of the top six in the draft were from either the Big Ten or or Florida. It's not, a, it's an accurate statement, but it's, it's kind of like a half truth. It doesn't tell the full story. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. And it's somewhat manipulated. And I don't know if that's intentional. However, what, what I think he's going for here is that this is repeated over and like, this isn't isolated to this year that the sec and Ohio state, Ohio State often by national pundits. And I, I sometimes get it. I many times get it gets lumped in as kind of being separate from the rest of the conference. Like just in regards to recruiting rankings, postseason success, it's almost like the SEC plays a brand of football and Ohio State almost plays that brand of football. And there's just, that often gets put together. Okay, but what's that got to do with the statement? We're talking about the first six picks of the 2023 draft. What? You're you're right. It's it's misleading. It's you it's don't think ac- that's a you don't think that it that even if it's a Freudian slip, you don't think that's a, a a way that you don't think comments like that are a subtle way of promoting. Maybe I'm making I'm probably making way too big of a deal of it, but you don't think it's a subtle way that ESPN's trying to promote their brand. It could be. Uh, I I target ESPN and find far more offensive things that they <laughs> that they push on the rest of us uh so so i'm not disagreeing with you i just believe that 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 sec ohio state narrative uh could go on for years and years and I years and, and and i think that he could be i'm not i don't know this for sure because i don't know his intent but as kind of like, well, this is what kind of goes on every year. Here it is again. Well, if you're going to overcome that reputation, you know, they they kind of did it this year. Like, if you just look at the draft this year, which is the better conference based on the draft? Probably the SEC, but it's pretty dang close. Right? Yeah, just based on the draft. Just based on the draft. Yes. Just based on the draft, it's pretty dang close. But so, it's almost like when we get into conversations about postseason play before the playoffs, looking at bowl season, uh, the SEC has positioned itself in which in a way that they have all this equity in the bank. And then, so have they done anything to discredit being number one? And in my eyes, no, but if you were, if you were taking this solely on its own and you were saying best conference, look at the NFL draft, you can make a case for the SEC. You can make a case for the big 10. But Agreed. going into it, when you have the most draft selections for 16 consecutive years, and then you still have the most draft selections, it probably just confirms they're still the best. Probably they're still just producing con- the best talent. Probably just confirms that. However, this was... It really indi- does confirm it. Well, but here's an indicator, Mark. A, a potential indicator, especially with the addition of USC and UCLA added to the conference next year. And Oklahoma and Texas. Uh, okay, well, let's side. talk about. Well, we can talk about Oklahoma and Texas. That's fine. Uh, but right now, I like the trajectory at USC a little bit better, and I like the trajectory at Oklahoma for, certainly. Uh, Texas versus UCLA, I'd probably, I'd probably favor Texas severely. Um, 
But my point is, I don't think the gap, the, the gap very well could be closing. Could be. Um, it could be. You, you I have, hope it is. I think you've got, we, I think the, the conference has benefited from offseason coaching hires in Luke Fickle and Matt Rule. Those are big names that came from non, well, Matt Rule was in the NFL. Uh, Luke Fickle was a, a non-Power 5 school, but he was the hottest name out there. So, anyways, we th- this is a fun debate because I, I I acknowledge what you're saying, but it was it was it was riveting for me to see the Big Ten perform so well in that draft on on Thursday, well Thursday through Saturday, and it gives me reason for at least pause to think maybe it's an indicator that things are evening out. Now, if you look at the playoff last season. You'd say, well, you know, once again, you had the SEC team winning the playoff. As you and I both know, those two semifinal games were ridiculously close. Um, Ohio State. Especially one of them. <laughs> well, yeah. Even more so than the Michigan game. We've got Michigan fans. They may argue with me, but I don't well, think I'm just it's saying. And, 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 and you're catching me right at on the fringe of having this conversation and being targeted by a bunch of Michigan fans the other day that were trying to claim that their playoff game was as close as Ohio State's, or they were also trying to claim that it was as valid uh, a, a performance as Ohio State's, which is completely and utterly ridiculous because Ohio State was playing Georgia and Michigan right. was playing TCU. And Georgia, I listen, some of this is the transitive property, but Georgia, we know what happened in the national championship game. Okay. We know what happened in the national title game. So, you're right. If, if, if it, what is the old saying? If, if, if ands and butts or butts and whatever it is, yeah. or candies and nuts, blah, 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 blah. It'd be Christmas or something. Yes. The, the fact of the matter is, Mark, one kick goes through those uprights. And I'm not saying Ohio State automatically yeah. beats TCU because you, we don't know that. No. But don't. I think it's likely Ohio State wins the national title if that kick goes through. And it wasn't, the kick wasn't even close, but it's a kick. It's a, it's a makeable kick for one of the best kickers in college football. So anyways, we can move on, but it's a, it's a fair point to make. And I don't think it would, maybe it's not as extreme of a gap as some people thought. Maybe it has been up until recently, but I wonder based on what we saw last season and based on what we saw in the draft if, and based on some coaching changes, if things will change and things were going to change, they are going to change when you hit the, you're either going to have, I mean, there. I, I don't see it moving evenly, right, in line with each other. Maybe they will, but with the with the additions of those four teams we just talked about, those four uh, universities to their respective conferences next year, the tide is going to shift somewhat. We'll just see which direction. And in the twenty twenty four season, we're going to go to a twelve team playoff, and that's going to test the upper echelon depth. Obviously not the depth of the entire league, but the upper echelon elite depth when you're talking about three and four teams playing against each other or having an opportunity to win a national championship from each league rather than just typically one. And real quick, because I know you got to get to something, but the news that uh, was it common knowledge or did I just miss it that, that the opening round games of the 12 team playoff will be played in, at a campus? Oh, they will be played on campus. Yes, that's been known for a long time. Uh, yeah, all that uh, was released in regards to dates and how many games, uh, like a, a Friday night opener and then three games on Saturday, played at you know, roughly noon, Eastern, four in prime time, something like that. I haven't looked at it, and I need to because obviously this is my business and this is what I do. I need to give that a look and uh and size that up, but uh, that that is intriguing. Yes. Well, some, somebody sent it to me, Mark, and and they were just speculating. What if what if Iowa ends up hosting a playoff game in December? Like that's a for for those teams from up north. That's a well, look at the NFL playoffs, and those are pros, but that's a significant a potential significant advantage. Absolutely, it is. That's why you don't. Well, I shouldn't say that's why you don't play non conference games in uh, November because Alabama plays Bethune Cookman. But the point is uh, we, we don't see that often. We don't see those non con Very rarely do we see non-conference games, especially from schools far away, non-rivalry schools. The 2015 Iowa team would have hosted a first round playoff game as a one loss team that just barely lost the big 10 championship. 
What about the 2021 team? Hey, no, no. Hold on. The 2021 on. team, had they beaten Michigan? They, they had a, Oh, they, had they beaten Michigan? Boy, you're taking a six-touchdown <laughs> leap there. Okay. I, I know. <laughs> Belligerence is way ahead of the game here. He's already looking forward to the 24-hour live stream to, to open the season. Belligerence, thank you so much for that. Uh, those decisions will be made at the time. But I would not be surprised if I'm up for the challenge again. Both of us are on the internet pretty much all the time. It's fun. You get to socialize. You get entertained. And in this day and age, it's pretty much necessary. And even if you're one of those people that's not on the internet all the time, you know what is? Your personal information. And there are people out there trying to hack you all the time. They want your email address. They want your phone number. They want your place of employment. And they want to do bad things with it. There's also fairly legitimate corporations and companies that want your information. They want it for marketing purposes. They're going to buy it. They're going to sell it. They're going to trade it. At the very least, it's annoying to you. It's a nuisance. It's aggravating. Your email gets cluttered up with spam email. You get robocalls all the time. That's at the very least. At the worst, it's a threat to your family, to your friends, to your personal information, to your banking, to your finances, to your security, to your safety, to your identity. It can be pretty serious. This video is sponsored by Aura. I got hacked and it was pretty obvious. This was about eight or nine months ago and there were red flags all over the place. And I didn't exactly know what to do, but I knew I needed to do something quickly. I mean quickly. I researched eight, 10 or 12 companies Immediately, I went all over the place. I asked people. I was online looking for the best company that could serve my needs and secure my information. You know who I found? Aura. And I'm glad I did. It was amazing. I contacted them. They got right back to me immediately. Their customer support is phenomenal. Their customer service is first rate friendly. They are detailed. They know what they're doing and they do it right and they will protect you. In addition to everything I just mentioned, they've got a password keeping service. They keep your credit score. They notify you anytime there's a possible data breach. This has happened to me a number of times. I'm getting notifications all the time when there's a possible compromise to my credit score or anything that I don't want. They've got a VPN that will allow you to browse the internet anonymously. It's amazing and again, customer service support available 24 seven. Click the link in the description section below and get two free weeks of aura. Protect your finances, protect your information, protect your privacy, protect your identity. I did. And I'm glad I did. Aura, thank you so much for what you've done for me. And now for my voice of college football community. There we have it. Uh, we thank uh, Aura for sponsoring the Voice of College Football on all our various channels. We have, uh, Corey, of course, uh, in recent weeks, discussed the wide receiver situation at Iowa. I uh, look at the transfer portal additions several times a day, and you know we have traded information back and forth every time we see somebody else enter the portal that could be a candidate, um, but you have not heard of Iowa's uh, serious interest in anybody in particular. Well, the kid down at Colorado, the Montana, whatever his last name yes. is, the hyphenated last name, Iowa contacted him in addition to like 30 other schools. Now, uh, I want to make this clear. I applaud them for doing that because I have been critical of them for not contacting players. So I have said in the past, look, I, I want you to offer people, but I want you to offer the right people, but at least contact people. It shows you're making an effort. So I applaud them for doing that. Not all of that's going to be out in the open, but you assume if I was putting their name out there to a number of high profile kids, that word's going to get out. It got out regarding uh, the kid from Colorado. I, I said one note, this, this is notable. I think um, the kid from Ohio state who Iowa may not have a shot against or with, but uh, is it Caleb Brown? 
Yes. Is that the correct name? Uh, he was offered by Iowa at a high school. He entered the portal what yesterday, the day before. You know, he's going to be any wide receiver at a high school. You know, or, excuse me, any wide receiver at Ohio State is probably going to be coveted in the transfer portal, with the ex- exception maybe being Austin Kutchner. But speaking of Austin, Mark, that could be a connection that they use uh, for Caleb. Besides the fact that they have some relationship with him because of following him and offering him at a high school. Um, now, uh, I don't know how, what, what is the pull for a, a player like uh, Austin, who's trying to get playing time to recruit a guy who's a- almost automatically going to be ahead of him on the depth chart. Like, <laughs> is that feasible? Do you think that happens a lot? Like if he was playing at a different position, that's one thing. Yeah. You wouldn't think so. No. So that's no, a, so I don't know point. how much yeah. how legitimate that, but there is a connection. They obviously they have a relationship with the kid, so I wouldn't be shocked to see them go after him. I mean, heck, I don't care what his stats are at Ohio State; he hadn't done much of anything. One catch, five yards. Who cares? Go get him. Go get him, oh, and let's go. Look at his recruiting ranking from the year before. He was the seventy fifth rated player in the country. He was the second rated player in Illinois, number thirteen wide receiver. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about that, haven't He's we? A high four star. We've talked about that. If you talk, especially at Ohio State, but most programs, uh, if you get scholarship guys from most programs, most Power Five programs, or I should say upper tier, it's safe to say upper tier Power Five programs, if they're on scholarship at that program, I a lot of them are going to be have an excellent chance to play. And I would venture to say that anybody on scholarship at Ohio State at that position would probably start at Iowa. Maybe that's maybe that's foolish thinking i even talked about maybe austin kutchner finding his way onto the the field this fall uh, i haven't heard anything about him making a big impact this past spring but well back to brown if iowa right out of high school signed the 13th rated wide receiver 79th player in the country they are probably, I would guess, on average, signing one out of a class of 25 higher than that overall ranking, typically. The Caden Proctors, the Xavier Wampas, those guys. There's about one per class. Yeah. So it's like acquiring the second highest rated player in your class. True. Yeah, that's fair. Um, now... Uh, the, the one variable at hand here is, you know, what, how much, how, how significant is Iowa's development at that position? And I think that's like it or not. Uh, I, I, I think it's clear that they have not developed wide receivers well under Kelton Copeland, uh, or under Brian Ferentz. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of places they could go. Uh, I said a week ago that based on what I had been told, I'm not real positive about AJ Henning to Iowa. I haven't heard anything on that. And I, until until things I mean they're going after receivers I think that's clear they're still pursuing receivers I've said this number of times Mark over the last few weeks I can't imagine a scenario in which they enter fall camp without at least one more scholarship player what's interesting though and I brought this up on the podcast yesterday as well they didn't have any scholarship players enter the portal post spring Mark that's a little odd and that is not – I expected one or two guys to leave. Now, maybe guys walk away. They, there could be guys that hang it up, that walk away for – maybe there's maybe there's guys who are ineligible and, and, and they won't be on scholarship this fall. That's possible. I don't want that to happen, but that's possible. There are other ways for guys to leave. You could have a grad transfer enter. And grad transfers can enter at any point, as did Charlie Jones a year ago. But right now, uh, they don't have – they don't have a bunch of scholarships sitting there waiting for for transfers to walk in that door. So there there are going to be moving pieces, even though we're heading into May now and into the summer months. Um, they're bringing in a kid from Rhode Island, a grad transfer DB, who's going to be visiting um, Iowa City. Is it this weekend or the following weekend? We know they've they've had some success at least early with, or I shouldn't say success, but they've uh, getting this guy to to campus is a is a big deal, right? When you can get a transfer to visit. Um, at defensive back, we'll see what they do at receiver. Much bigger need, I think, at receiver than DB. Um, but you also think you have a better chance of landing a big name at DB than wide receiver. You would think uh, that there are conversations going on, uh, you know, throughout the off season 
that there is a target number of players for each position, for each positional unit for a football team. So take Iowa. We, we would optimally like to have this many wide receivers, this many running backs, this many offensive linemen. Okay, that's not the end-all be-all because obviously if you have um, – you're not strong in the starting positions in that particular group, or you are, then, you know, it can be massaged, but still, uh, if they are that heavy on total scholarships on the roster and they are that thin at wide receiver, you would think that they would have nudged some people out the door in some other positional units to make room. The ball hasn't dropped. It didn't drop. The, the windows closed. I don't have, I don't have an explanation for it. Like I said, maybe maybe there'll be news coming of some sort. I, I don't have an explanation. I did have somebody, Mark, and, and you tell me if this is uh, if you know anything about this. This was uh, let me find the comment. Um, now I don't know that I have it. Let me see if I can find it here. Somebody had made a comment about Spencer Petrus on the podcast yesterday, and maybe that. Uh, Maybe that comment got deleted. Yeah, I don't see it anymore. Uh, Mark, somebody said on the YouTube channel that Spencer Petrus' uh, scholarship does not count against Iowa's total. Based on what? That's what I responded. I said, ba- I, I wasn't trying to be snarky, but that's what I said back. Based on what? <laughs> How does it not count towards the scholarship limit? This isn't 2021, Mark. They had the exempt. There was the exemption going for one year, where guy where they were able to go over the scholarship count for that following season. Correct. I think they extended it. Then it was initially announced, and then everyone went through the twenty one season, and then it was extended even for last season. But it is now ended. Okay, I wasn't even aware. Of it. I just knew they don't have unlimited scholarships. I shouldn't say unlimited. They don't have. They can't have. There's also roster limits. At this level, too. Yes. I don't know how those are affected. 105. But, okay, there you go. Based on everything I know, Spencer Petrus is on scholarship, and that counts against the total, because the total is what the total is. Are you hearing this from credible sources? Hearing what from credible sources? That Spencer Petrus's um, scholarship does not count against Iowa. No, no, no. I'm just saying somebody made this comment. This oh. Some some random person okay. told it stated, like it was fact, His scholarship does not count against the total. And I said, that's, I don't know where the information is coming from. I think that's false. Uh, And by the way, I'm looking here. The comment has since been taken down. Do you recall during spring practice, during any of the news conferences, whether Kirk was asked about Scott? That should be, that should always be asked, but especially in this transfer portal era, that should be that question should be asked on a regular basis. It should be asked after the season, before spring practice, after spring practice, every news conference. Where do we stand on scholarships? Yeah, I don't know. A good question. I, I watched the press conference. I wasn't there in person. If if there are still question marks, I mean, we're going to know a lot more in August, but I'll be at media day and I'll I'll ask a question. Uh Bobby in the chat says Scott Dockerman is reporting that uh, he counts toward the scholarship. Again, I just don't know why he wouldn't. Jason in the chat, he says, um, did he take a medical scholarship? A medical scholarship, a medical hardship waiver? Doesn't that still count against your total? Am I am I wrong in that? Does that not count against your total just because you're taking a medical? And why would he have taken a medical? He played almost all of last... How could he have taken a medical? He played literally in every game but the bowl game. <laughs> he, he, Unless he, they in some way can prove that his season is compromised coming up but i don't think that that can you can't do that no he's already played it counts but based on everything i know it counts towards it and i'm not i said in the podcast yesterday i'm not i'm not uh ripping on kirk for keeping him on scholarship i'm not i understand there's value there but i also think it's a fair topic to discuss is is that the right move to keep spencer peters on scholarship if he has no chance of contributing as a player on this team because you're not handing out scholarships for guy. You're not handing out scholarships for coaches. So if he's a coach, hire him on the staff. Is that, is that fair to say, is that a fair topic? It, to, it's fair to say, and it sets us up for a topic in future weeks. 
I think we should look at this quarterback backup quarterback position and see if I was in a position to confidently go into the season. Well, that, that's what I say. I mean, we watched a spring game and Deacon Hill looked like the second best quarterback on the roster. There were there was talk about maybe Joey Labus enters the portal during that open window. Again, n- nobody did. The, the, the window's closed. So I guess they dodged a bullet there and they have both those guys coming back for fall camp, presumably. And then you have Marco Linez coming in uh, this summer. Based on what I've heard, uh, Spencer Petrus is working with the offensive line. Yes. <laughs> so you've got, let's just, recap, let's just recap this. You have a former quarterback helping coach the offensive line and you have a former offensive lineman coaching quarterbacks. <laughs> That's what it is. Brian Ferentz is coaching quarterbacks. Brian Ferentz is a former offensive lineman. Spencer Petrus, the former quarterback coaching offensive line. There are a lot of eyes on that offensive line. They better be damn good this fall. Very strange. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of cooks in the kitchen, Mark. And also, Keon Coleman, Michigan State wide receiver, 58 receptions. He has entered the transfer portal. Now, there is talk that he and Mel Tucker had a heart-to-heart today, and maybe he's going to stay at Michigan State. Aww. But as of right now, uh, both Peyton Thorne, Michigan State starting quarterback, and wide receiver Keon Coleman, again, their leading receiver in the transfer portal. There's another wide receiver. Well, they, they don't have a chance. I, I, I'm not saying that they shouldn't contact him. They don't have yeah. a chance with Keon Coleman. <laughs> So I did bring him up. Like at least the kid from Colorado, he hasn't put <laughs> Keon Coleman was, wasn't he the number one receiver on that team? Yeah. Yeah. I forget it, but yeah. uh, you know, doesn't mean you shouldn't contact and doesn't mean you shouldn't reach out and you've got NIL possibly uh, to work with you. I know you, you have NIL to work with. Absolutely. Um, how does that compete against other schools? I don't know, but uh, I, I'm kind of, I'm kind of done speculating on what are they going to do in the portal? Because, you know, it, it's, it, I guess if they don't mark, they don't, if, if they just go into the, I don't think they're going to do this, but if, if they go into the next, next fall camp and, and the, the, the scholarship guys are the scholarship guys. I mean, they, if you look at the freshmen they have coming in this summer, they have enough, like they have enough scholarship guys, technically, right? You've got Ragaini, Deontay Vines, uh, Jacob Bostic, Seth Anderson, that's four. Then you add in Dayton Howard, true freshman, Jarrett Bowie, true freshman, Alex Moda, true freshman. There's seven scholarship receivers, Mark, <laughs> but almost nobody with any real experience minus Nico Ragaini. I mean, nobody. Uh, Vines had a little bit last year, but man alive, if they do that, it's going to be a <laughs> it's going to be a storyline, man. Um, so I, I think they'll get somebody. Probably just one guy. That's what my guess is. Uh, I think if they were gotten two, they would have already done that. I would think they would have got at least gotten one at this point. Um, I saw somebody bring up the FCS uh, power, a group of five level. Yeah, maybe they do that again. But I don't know. When you're trying to bring a guy in, Mark, and he's not going to have spring practice. You'd want. I, I feel like you'd want a guy who's experienced at this level who's seasoned, who's a veteran. And I know that those are guys, types of guys are hard to come by this late in the process. But trying to get a guy from Division II or from FCS or Group of Five and throwing him into fall camp and expecting him to start this fall, that is a scary, scary thought in my mind. There have been at least 10 wide receivers entered the transfer portal that could definitely help Iowa, if not be the number one wide receiver for Iowa. Get somebody. Get two. Should get two, but get somebody. Yeah. Corey Bradda from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Get on over there. Check out Corey's work on men's and women's basketball. And, of course, uh, headed toward the 2023 college football season right here at the Voice of College Football. It is now the month of May. Therefore, it is Great Debate Month. And our first debate is uh, coming your way Wednesday night at 8.30 Eastern. Over on the main channel, we debate realignment Big 12, Pac-12. And uh, if you've been following folks on social media and otherwise, you know that there are warring clans there between the Big 12 and the Pac-12 about the future of those two conferences. So 8.30 on Wednesday night, 8.30 Eastern. Corey, thank you so much. We will see you for Edition 92 next week. Sounds good, Mark.